Welcome to Season 3 of Purposeful Empathy. My name is Anita Novak, and this show is all about amplifying the voices of people around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. This episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am honored and privileged and excited to be joined by Peter Samuelson, who is a serial pro-social entrepreneur. In 1982, he co-founded the Starlight Children's Foundation. And by 1990, the positive psychological impact of Starlight seeded his next impact endeavor, Starbright World, co-founded with Steven Spielberg. Today, he is co-founder and president of First Star, and CEO of Film Co Media. After serving as a production manager on films like The Return of the Pink Panther, he emigrated from England to Los Angeles and produced films like Revenge of the Nerds, Tom and Viv, Wild, Arlington Road, and 20 other films. Educated at Cambridge and the Anderson School of Management at UCLA, Peter resides in LA with his wife, Sarah, and continues to fight for those less fortunate, chief among them, America's abused and neglected children. Welcome to the show, Peter. Well, thank you. And you, you do me great honor. I shall try <laughs> to live up to the billing. So, of course, in preparation for this, I did lots of research, watched some of your talks, went to your websites, and I nearly fell over when I read that the tagline of your film company, filmcomedia.com, and we'll have information about how viewers and, and listeners can, can catch uh, your, your uh, website in the description below. You, your tagline says, making movies that make a difference by taking audiences from empathy to action. And empathy to action is exactly what purposeful empathy is about. So I feel like you're really singing a song that I love. I've also then was, you know, immediately drawn to like, okay, what have they done? So um, I watched with my husband, Foster Boy, over the weekend. And the young man who plays the protagonist in that film is such a thrilling actor. And I was devastated at the end, you know, at the end, you have stats about, you know, the foster care system and what happens. I mean, it was such a moving film. And the work that you're trying to do with your film company is What's the vision? Tell us about that. Well, I, I, my partner, Jonathan Prince, and I um, founded Filmco because we realized that people who are really adept, clever at telling stories audiovisually pretty much generate the empathy in our audiences while they are watching the material and for maybe 20 minutes afterwards. But by the time the audience has left the theater or got up to do the washing up or walk the dog or whatever, we, we've lost them. That empathy has dissipated. Empathy has a very short shelf life. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have amazing 501c3s, NGOs, charities, doing extraordinary work that are very good at activating people, very good um, at preaching to the choir of those who already support, um, arguably some of the worst storytellers in the world. You're, you're never going to see um, your average charity ED uh, or board member um, in olden days, um, they are not the people who would stand on the rock and say in the village and say, gather ye around and I will tell you a story. It's just not um, their thing. So what we did with Filmco is we said, how can we bake in from the very beginning of our development process? What if we only developed film and television one-offs, series, long form, short form, podcasts, documentary, narrative fiction. What if we only embarked on a project if we, in parallel to getting the script right and casting it and assigning it to a director, getting the thing financed, budgeting it, all the stuff that one does as a producer, what if in parallel to that we 
ensured that the activation, the actual, what will we do with this film to make the world a better place? What if we made sure going in and throughout that um, it was meaningful and not just, I think, tepid result, you know, greater audience awareness. Um, that's, I think, a baseline. But what if you could actually change public policy? What if you could actually measurably increase the number of organ donor um, people, you know, on the back of their driver's license? What if you could um, greatly enhance people's attention to global warming and carry it back in their lives to individual acts of kindness to the planet? Um, what if we could do those things? So the way that it works, it's there's a team of us, you know, there's about 20 people running Filmco. We've made it through COVID. We're in our roadshow right now doing another raise for um, second round financing. Um, it's going very well. It seems to suit um, high net worth people uh, and, and um, funds and donor advised funds if they care about both uh, getting their money back and making a profit on the one hand, but also legacy, um, feeling that they ought, also ought to move the needle. So the way it works is that when we start developing a project, we do a lot of research and we bring in as subject experts one or more nonprofits, um, normally three thereabouts, and we meet with them extensively. So, for example, we have a project called In a Heartbeat. It's a wonderful script. It's action adventure. It's about a man driving a parcel from A to B against a ticking clock. And we come to understand that what is in the box is a child's heart. And it is being taken by him by road from one hospital to another hospital. And if he doesn't get it to the second hospital by 10 o'clock tonight, another child will die and he has to go through a, a terrible storm and the road is washed out and he, he takes a wrong turning and ends up in a, in a drug deal um, um, and so forth. But when we sat with the organ donor procurement charity, um, we said to them in the first place, here's the first draft script, give us notes. And they did. They said, you know, this is not quite right. Technically, this is what we call that person. And this is what this person does. And this is how the handoff is done. And this is the nature of the person who takes the heart from A to B. And then they said, um, we do have one other um, request. And we all said, yeah, what, what? And they said, well, could you make the donor family who we meet in the script and come to know quite well, can you make them African-American? And we said, yeah, of course we can. Never thought of that, but absolutely. Why wouldn't we do that? And they said, well, no, no, no. There's a special reason, which is there's great reticence in the black community to trust organized medicine. The Tuskegee experiments, you know, there's a hundred years of that community being messed around in some shameful ways by organized medicine and they just tend not to sign up as organ donors. And it's a, it's a big hole in, in, in our organ donor registry. We said, yeah, of course we can do that. So we made that change too. Once we um, start making the film, we have the nonprofit on set and it is electrifying when the cast, including the stars and the crew hear why we are making a film it's um talk about an energizing mm -hmm. influence and then in post-production um we keep showing them cuts of the film and you know hopefully the film gets better and better uh but they're fully along with us and we develop with them a marketing campaign that is very unusual and kind of unprecedented um if you work with the world wildlife fund or you um work with the American Cancer Society. They have literally millions of members who care about the issue. If you work with them and you cut them in a piece of the profits and they become really your, your, your partner, 
you can then uh, ask them to blast out um, to their constituency along the lines of, you know, the film opens at your local uh, multiplex on Friday. Over the weekend, could you take a couple of friends and go and see it? And uh, if you like it, could you know, it's our film. Uh, it's our agenda. Um, this is a huge opportunity for us. Can you help us propagate it? That is such a unusually focused way of advertising a film to the core audience who already agree with the core um, uh, advocacy issue. What is our alternative? What do we normally do as independent producers? Well, you, you, you put a poster on the back of a bus and you hope that someone will follow the bus. They will look at the poster. The poster will be good enough. The title will be memorable enough. They'll see who's in it, maybe recognize a face, see a name. And by the time they get home, you're hoping that they might remember that they really want to watch that on Netflix or whatever it may be. Um, that's really a blunt instrument. Whereas if you can get um, thought makers who already are aligned with the issue to become advocates for the film, which is the advocacy platform for what they already believe in, that is an enormous uplift. And as you mentioned on Foster Boy, the film that I made, uh, Filmco is a new company. Um, I made um, Foster Boy with different partners just before the beginning of Filmco, but it's very much the same um, sort of theory. Um, it, it's a film. It's got Matthew Modine and uh, it's got Lou Gossett Jr. and Amy Brenneman from Judging Amy and so on and so forth. Um, and this amazing young man, Shane Paul McGee, who plays the um, uh, foster kid who's now actually left foster care, uh, but who was very badly abused in foster care by the for-profit entity that ran the foster care system in that location and we have for profit foster care in 28 states i personally believe i'm a, i'm a big capitalist but i believe you should go make a buck somewhere else leave the kids alone the senate finance committee absolutely established through published research that the outcome stats for from for profit foster care uh, are dramatically worse than those when foster care is run by agencies that are either non-profit or local government itself through a specialized department. So we made the film. Um, the website is uh, fosterboy.com, but we have a petition drive going on at the moment. We think there is a window of opportunity to have President Biden's White House take a lead in doing down for profit foster care, foster care to make a buck on the heads of the kids because he has recently, about six weeks ago, he announced that for-profit prisons were going to be phased out. Mm -hmm. um, and if you believe, and I do, that it is immoral to be making money on the heads of convicted felons, well, then how could you possibly believe it's a good idea on the heads of children who did nothing wrong they just had the great misfortune to be abused or neglected and to uh, be removed from their families and end up in foster care. Um, how can you consider that a, um, a way of making money? Uh, it should be done for pro-social reasons. So um, we have a core group of seven nonprofits who are partnered with us. Um, the um, campaign is at uh, www.fixfostercare, or one word, .org, fixfostercare.org, and it's a petition. We want to get a million signatures on it. We're already talking to the White House and Congress. I think we have a, um, a good shot of actually changing the law. We are using the film hand over fist in all directions, we have almost 100 nonprofits who have used it um, to lobby legislators, to show to their members, to use as a, a, a sort of a spark plug towards their agendas uh, to support foster kids in one way or another. Um, 
That's an example. That is a double bottom line pro-social motion picture. And I'm, 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 I'm quite proud of it. Uh, we won uh, the top award at 14 film festivals. Uh, it's all over VOD. You know, it was supposed to be released theatrically, but then COVID, COVID, COVID. So it's on every view on demand platform, you know, Fandango and iTunes and uh, Amazon Prime and all the rest of them. Um, it's a film, but it's also the spark plug for a campaign. So, you know, as I'm listening to you talk, it's, there's no question that I sense from you that, okay, so you're a businessman, you said that you're a capitalist, you're a filmmaker, you're looking for partnerships, but like there's so much earnest concern about the subject that you're, you know, filming and then looking for ways to activate that empathy for either policy change or, you know, uh, changing how people behave uh, or make decisions vis-a-vis -vis this subject. I'm curious to know, because that's where you are now in your career, but you've been doing this for a very long time in a variety of different ways as a, um, you know, founder of different charities and initiatives. I wonder if there's a backstory to, that might illuminate why you feel this need to do more than just, you know, have a job, live your life, raise your family. Like it's, it's, it feels to me like there's a, a North Star that's guiding you in a big way. Well, I'm actually ashamed that it took me all of these years to work out that you can do, do both things in one room and that I am an unusual executive in knowing how to do both things. One of them is to um, entrepreneur motion pictures and occasionally television into happening. You know, it's, a, it, it's the ultimate entrepreneurial uh, task. Um, is this idea big enough for me to give it 18 months of my life? Um, who is my creative team? Um, uh, is the script good enough? Let's do a table reading. Um, let's perfect it. Uh, where's the money going to come from? What is this film going to cost? Who is distributing it? What is the nature of the advertising campaign that will bring it to people's attention? That's a whole toolkit. It, I realize now with, you know, 2020 hindsight, I've used the same toolkit philanthropically for 35 years. Uh, I have had what I thought was a big idea for a new solution to an old social challenge. Seriously, old kids are sad. That's not good for them. And furthermore, their mums and dads and siblings are sad. What can we do about it? Um, Foster kids don't go to college. Only 9% of American foster kids go to college. Only 3% earn a degree. That's insane because it's the best thing you could do for a foster kid. They've got no family that's any good. Um, they're, they're shunted around like a cardboard box from placement to placement. Um, but it's, easier, it's easy to realize that it would be really good if they would go to colleges and universities but how do you actually do that? Well, the, the toolkit of a film producer is you are often looking at outside the box solutions um, to, um, you know, hoary old problems. Or another one, um, we have just in Los Angeles County, no one really knows, but between 75,000 and 100,000 unhoused human beings, 45% um, female. 55% male and 15% under the age of 18. We have old ladies sleeping in cardboard boxes. So I thought, um, I wonder if I can build a shelter. So I got an architect, a space planner, and a budgeter. And we worked out that to create 100 beds to buy the land, build the building, and kit it out is about $5 million, which is achievable. I, I know how to raise that, but the, the numbers are not in favor of it as a solution, because if you say that $5 million is going to get you 100 beds, that means each bed is costing $50,000.
Uh, and if you have 100,000 unhoused people just in L.A. County, maybe three times that in the country, no one really knows the effect of the COVID. All these, you know, waitresses with a small child who lost their job and are now homeless and that kind of thing. People who fell off the edge of the American dream. Um, so if you do the math, you're looking at five billion dollars just to house the unhoused of greater Los Angeles. I have no idea how you raise five billion dollars. So one of the things film producers don't do is give up. We never give up. We are relentless bastards getting our films made and getting them to their audience. And I asked myself, I wonder if we could reverse engineer it. I wonder what is the absolute best we could do for a person living in a cardboard box, which is damp and smells bad on a rainy night. What could we do with $600? And I conceptualized this thing called an EDAR. It's only called an EDAR, E-D-A-R dot org is, is the website. It's only called an EDAR because I couldn't think of a name. And I thought, well, everyone deserves a root, E-D-A-R. So that's the acronym. So I, I went off to the Pasadena Art Center of Design and I said to Dean Korshek, if I put up a little prize, could all of your students compete? And the competition would be to design this thing that I can see it in my mind, but I have the design ability of a newt. Um, but, but hey, they're all training to be professional designers. I said, I know that in the daytime, it's like a big shopping cart and you push it around and put your stuff in it and do your recycling or whatever. But at night, you park it, you put the brakes on, you let the front down, you let the back down, and now you have a six foot, six inch long cot that is off the ground, which is enclosed and has four windows and a door. And it, the whole thing has to cost less than $600. He said, we should do it. So we did it. And the competition was won by two young men, Jason Zaza and Eric Linderman. Eric's still working with us. He's on the board of edar.org. We've just done a redesign. We did a focus group with people who were using our original ones. We had we got up to about 300 of them on Skid Row and we interviewed the users and we asked them, is it too big? Is it too small? Do the wheels make too much noise when you push it along and on and on? And we made modifications and we actually have just received a container load of them from the factory. Uh, we were awarded two patents. The only reason to get the patents, which we, the designers, have donated to the charity entirely, um, is that I think maybe we could even sell them to government, like to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or maybe to people who fight forest fires. Um, you know, you could drop them on parachutes out of a big aircraft and then people putting the forest fire out when they were off shift uh, would have somewhere right there that they could sleep. Um, so it's all very exciting. The Mark IIs are going to start flowing out in May and you can see what it looks like. Uh, you can even sponsor some on edar, E-D-A-R dot org. And we would love that. We're all volunteers at EDAR. No one's getting paid. And um, I think we have to do something. In the end, society is like a chain. It's only as strong as its weakest link. Thank you. And I think one of our weakest links is, well, I, I can give you a concrete example. Um, what sort of made me mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore, and I'm going to do something about it, is I met a homeless old lady actually I have no idea how old she is. But when I said, you know, where do you sleep? She said, come with me and I'll show you. And she sort of led me by the sleeve onto the um, wasteland that is next to the San Diego freeway um, near Santa Monica Boulevard. And she said, this is where I sleep. And she pointed to a ginormous cardboard box. And on the side of the cardboard box, it said Sub-Zero. And I thought, OK, this is my little moment of empathetic epiphany. 
this is unacceptable. We have the refrigerator and this poor deer has got the cardboard box it came in. And what do we, maybe she goes to bed and we separately go to bed, what, three, four miles apart? What's the matter with this picture? It's just unacceptable. So that led to the EDA, the EDA odyssey. Um, and I'm very excited. I think the new ones are about twice as good as the old ones. And they were already pretty good. They're still in use, you know, a number of years after we distributed them. So obviously we give them away to homeless people, but we're dependent on donations on the website. So edar.org, if there's anyone out there who wants to see what it looks like and donate, you can donate a whole EDAR for $600, 10 EDARs, $6,000. Um, and if that's too much money, uh, a set of wheels is a hundred bucks. So there you go. Fantastic. You know what you remind me of? So about 10 years ago, I was working on my PhD and I interviewed social entrepreneurs to understand why they spent their time and their talent and energy working on these change making issues. Right. And that's how I came to stumble on empathy, because through these interviews with all these different social entrepreneurs from around the world at different levels of scale, different kinds of social problems or environmental problems, Ultimately, it all came down to the same baseline where they felt empathy for a person or a group of people that were suffering and felt the need, the absolute need to act on that empathy. And so that's what you're describing, right? You see a problem and you feel this compulsion to do something about it. What I'm finding, though, is that, and that's a great part of the story, like we, we, we admire people like you who are doing something about uh, the social ills of the world. But I wonder if you would indulge how you personally have changed as a result of your change making work. How has it impacted your relationships, how you go to sleep at night, your world vision? I'm curious because I would sense from you, you sound like a very happy individual. Um, and I'd just be curious to know what you, know, what, what, what you feel as a result of the work you do. So because I'm a film producer, um, I know an awful lot of agents and lawyers. <laughs> Every so often, I end up having breakfast and over eggs, someone says to me something along the lines of, you know, I'm earning over half a million dollars a year. I'm completely miserable. I'm, I'm working 12 hours a day, six days a week. I have no life. All I have is money. And you seem much happier. How do you do that? And I say, oh, well, don't give up your day job, but do some volunteering. Actually use, you know, if you if you are a um, an entrepreneur. Um, fine, you can just donate money to someone else's charity. But why don't you entrepreneur a new solution? an outside the box uh, solution to an old problem. Or if you're a lawyer, go be the lawyer for foster kids. They don't have enough lawyers, you know? They, are, they go into court, they're unrepresented. Go be the legally competent friend, get training. The American Bar Association will train you. Use your skill set and you watch how much happier you are when you're actually exerting yourself and having victories every so often in helping those who are less fortunate and it'll bless everything else in your life. And you will also find that there's this amazing camaraderie of people who help each other to achieve noble goals. I mean, it's the best of us. Someone would have to, someone was a real so-and-so, an awful person, and there are a few, um, why would they ever have anything to do with a charity? They, they don't go to the charity to help. Um, so the people that you meet at the charity are the salt of the earth. I'm so privileged because what my philanthropic work has done is to expose me to um, a lot of people who are less fortunate and through the prism of actually having a way to get foster kids into college to send families with a seriously ill child to Disney World and make them happy and rebond the 
the mother and the father together and all that kind of thing. So I have lots of joys from it. My, my heart is moved, you know, every few minutes when I'm doing my um, nonprofit um, work. Um, and I think it blesses and makes me appreciate uh, my own life. You know, I, I, I owe almost everything that I am now to one man. Um, I grew up in London and I had a um, ninth grade English teacher called Mr. Lund, uh, David Lund. Um, although, of course, you were never, a, a, he was a teacher, so you were never allowed to use his first name. So it was always Mr. Lund. Um, he said to me, see me after school. Oh, dear. Um, and he, I remember he poked me in the chest with his finger and he said, now, listen, Samuelson, if you work about twice as hard and I help you, you will be able to go to a really excellent university. And I said, Mr. Lund, I don't think so. He said, why do you say that? And I said, well, as far as I know, there is not a single human being in my entire extended family has ever attended a college or university. And he said, oh, well, then it'll be even better. I said to him, my father left school when he was 14. And Mr. Lund said, it'll be even better then because you'll be the first one. I've been blessed by success. I've been blessed by literally tens of thousands of volunteers involved in my various philanthropic endeavors. And now with Filmco, maybe we have leverage to affect material change in society by generating empathy, but baking in an activation plan so that while the person's heart is moved, there is a clear, you know, five bullet point course of action you know, hold your cell phone up to the screen, whether it's on Netflix or it's in a theater. Um, that uh, grid thing will take you to the website. And, oh, you you always thought about becoming a foster parent, but you never did anything about it. Put your zip code in. We'll tell you where you could get trained up and assessed. Um, oh, you're actually a lawyer, but you're not a children's lawyer. Well, put your zip code in and we'll send you to the American Bar Association in your location. They'll train you up to be a volunteer children's lawyer. Do it under your blotter. Don't give up your day job. Use your skill set to help these kids. You'll feel so happy. That's right. You will feel happy uh, engaging in purposeful empathy. So as a final question, you've been super, super generous with your time. Um, you've already mentioned Mr. Lund, so maybe this is the Mr. Lund story and it's done for the day, or maybe you have another one, but I like, I'm in the habit now of asking my guests at the end of the show to share a story. If one comes to mind about when you were on the receiving end of empathy, purposeful empathy and what that meant for you. So does anything come up? Yeah, I think where my heart has been moved and where, if you like, I got my jollies mm -hmm. has been repeatedly because a young person who is receiving services, help, encouragement from one of my nonprofits does or says something. And I think, oh, my God, what a gift this is. I'll, I'll give you a couple of very short examples. Uh, there we were at UCLA in one of the big uh, auditoria, watching the talent show of first star foster kids. So they're singing, they're dancing one or two or three at a time. And then down goes one of our, I guess, 10th graders and stands on the stage and up comes the pre-recorded music and she has stage fright and she cannot get a note out of her mouth. And it's hugely embarrassing and she's mortified and I'm looking at the director and I'm realizing she's going to go down and usher the student off the stage. And this is dreadful. And oh, my God. And then an amazing thing that we, the grownups, had nothing to do with happened uh, in the same class as the student who couldn't get a note out is a great big um 
uh, like a blocking tackle sized young man, big guy, six foot tall. Um, and he goes down on the stage and he plants his body between the audience and the girl and whisper, whisper, whisper. And we can't hear what they're saying. And then suddenly two other students go down. So now there are four of them and then seven and then 12 and then 15 and then 25. And now all 30 are in a kind of scrum on the stage and whisper, whisper, whisper. And someone on the outside of the scrum goes like this. And up comes the playback music. And out of the middle of this little group of young people comes this little plaintive voice. And it gets stronger and strongly, stronger. And by the end of the song, she's belting it out. And now the audience, they've all gone behind her. So now we can see her. And they all came down off the stage with their arms around each other. And I thought, if I have no other gift this year, this is a really good one. And um, that's what First Star does. And that's what my other philanthropies do. And that's what my media is encouraging people to enable by affecting change. And we need to do it. The world is fragile. You know, we're only as strong as our weakest link, that old lady in the sub-zero box. We, we need to um, do our bit to lift up the American dream and make our society better. Another advantage of exerting empathy is it's where polarized people who are polarized politically uh, leave their politics at the door when they are packing kindness kits in carrier bags for unhoused people during COVID. I think we've lost the thread in bringing our country together, but my intuition is where our country comes together is in good deeds, in leverage change, in volunteerism, um, through our 501c3s, that is where our common dream is. And it is where we find, it's where we break bread by packing it in carrier bags for other people who need it. Well, on that note, we're gonna have all the information about how people can step up to, to, for your organizations that you've identified and also can go to your website to see the pipeline of films that are uh, coming out in the future. It was such a delight to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank everybody who's been listening and watching, and we'll see you at the next episode of Purposeful Empathy. It was an honor. Thank you. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grant Huron International, you get to select the coach of your choice anytime from any place. Visit GrantHuronInternational.com to harness the power of on-demand coaching today.